course, which is looking at digital financing and how digital financing and fintech can be applied to the SDGs. Okay. Um, I think, think the, I have the very yeah. unenviable task of you digesting your food while I speak, <laughs> and also having just arrived from back from uh, a trip yesterday, so I'm also hitting the major jet lag point. So just remember. As tired as you are from food, I might be more tired from jelly. Uh, the, what I would like to do, since we're talking a lot about this issue of consciousness, I want to be conscious of my own biases, and so I'm going to share those with you up front. Uh, so, bias number one, as someone pointed out earlier, I am a white male who was born into a middle class family in Wisconsin. Um, and yes, raised by a group of, not raised by, but schooled by a group of relatively liberal Catholic nuns when I was young. So there is some social conscience in there, despite the fact that I look like this. Uh, bias number two, uh, most of my career has been in finance, and so I'm going to have a finance perspective of this, starting with commercial finance, but then I spent over 20 years doing microfinance and digital finance in developing countries. So you also may hear some bias about that ground, the grounding that I have in that. Uh, bias number three, um, I work for the United Nations. <laughs> so the United Nations is not always known for bold action or bold controversial discussion. We are a political organization by nature with lots of member states. So while I'm looking forward to having a very good and constructive conversation, um, this will be a combination of UN uh, work, but also some of my own personal beliefs, and I'll feel compelled to tell you when it's my personal belief. So, with that, um, let me first tell, me, tell you a little bit about why we're even looking at this from a UN perspective. First, financial services in the finance industry is undergoing massive change right now. That's not news to anyone. Digitization of finance has been happening for 50 years. The digitalization, so more technology-driven finance, has been happening for about the past 20 years. But what we're seeing now is because of the growth in the massive amounts of data that is feeding new technologies, we're actually facing a real change in the way finance has been done, challenging the way finance was done for the last 500 years based on normal practices. And so what the graph just shows you is that finance is a relatively mid-level change or mid-level actor when it comes to disruptive change. What we mean by that is that there are a lot of impediments to the financial sector changing because of digitalization. The key impediments really are policy and regulatory. It's a, it's a very regulated sector. Another is that there are very high entry costs to finance, both in terms of costs of capital, but also costs of technology. But what we're seeing is that through this graph, and this, the point of this graph is that some, some, uh, some industries are very durable in the sense that they're fairly resistant to change, and that can be because they're either immune to technology or because the, the incumbent power, the structure of that industry is such that the technology is really just going to assist in doing the way things are currently being done and by whom better. As opposed to when you move up sort of around counterclockwise, you get to this viability slide, which is industries that move through uh, disruptive experience go through a period of being high, highly vulnerable than highly volatile till eventually they reach a new viable state. But that new viable state could be represented by very different actors than were in the durable state and by very different business models and practices that existed when they were in the durable state. And so some examples of those that are up in the viability corner, for instance, are the communications industry. Imagine how much communications has been disrupted by technology. But the entertainment industry. The entertainment is now one that's moving towards a new level of viability, but has been under massive disruption in terms of music and video, et cetera, over the last few years. Finance finds itself right now in the vulnerability stage because there's still lots of barriers, but what we see is when those barriers are removed. Take, for example, payments which is one area where barriers have been removed relatively uh, recently as far as finance and how quickly the game changes. No longer are banks the center of payments, at least not in terms of the front end. Instead, payments are being managed by companies that had relatively little to do with finance. Social network platforms like Tencent uh, and WeChat in China or Alipay also in China. So you're seeing new actors, new models, et cetera. And there's just some examples of that on the left just seeing how the financial sector has a lot of threats when the, the market really opens, 
that this leads to new technology-based actors coming into finance and remembering that their focus is on technology and what feeds the rest of their industry, not necessarily finance. So it's a whole change in the motivation of those actors. And then also there's a huge amount of money starting to flow into FinTech. And it varies in terms of where it's, where it's going, initially into payments, and now of course we're seeing more into other aspects of it, particularly around different types of cryptocurrency and to some extent blockchain. So we, we were looking at some of the changes in the UN because we wanted to understand this and what this meant for financing in terms of the UN sustainable, in terms of the sustainable development goals and what the UN should be thinking. And just some observations about what's going on in the finance sector. You're seeing massive amounts of investment by financial institutions of all types in technology, but also changing their workforces. The workforce is now in some of the major banks is shifting to 40 to 50% people that are engaged in tech that are not financial sector specialists. Um, and also that traditional method, having been a former banker, where everything is very siloed from bank to bank, including your whole core infrastructure, is changing where you're seeing more plug and play type development of core banking systems. So you can cobble together the best technologies in a secure fashion. And actually that's creating a lot of economies of, uh, of it, or reducing the barriers to entry. So you're seeing these challenger banks come up who are basically virtual in nature and start up with a very uh, far level, lower level of initial capital investment. Um, front office innovations, which we've all experienced. When was the last time you had to go into a branch? Maybe how many of you have transferred money using your phone? Start with that. All right, so almost everyone in this room. For those of you who haven't, give it a go. It's great. Don't have to, don't have to go to a bank. But what's interesting about those front office innovations is not only the way that it's changing our interactive experience with finance, which is it's almost faceless, but it's also very personal. If you look at your phone, you feel a level of familiarity and comfort when you log on to your bank website and do that payment to a person that came out of your contact list from your WhatsApp. So it feels very personal. So it's changing finance in a way, both depersonalizing it and personalizing it at the same time. Um, but what it's also doing is through that interaction is gathering ever more data on you. And that ever more data is necessary to feed that core infrastructure that they're developing. And so a big part of all that interaction at the front is not just about making you happy, it's about you giving them as much information as they can possibly get so that they can feed the new way of doing making decisions within the financial sector. You're seeing a change in that there's a proliferation of digital business models. So Whereas before finance still had a head, lot of heavy intervention, now you're seeing some business models within finance that are purely non-human intervention. And it started off, of course, with payments, but now look at lending. You're seeing lending, which is you can get a loan in three seconds in China. Non, no human intervention whatsoever. Uh, and that's through the Alipay program. And then the rise of platforms is that when you're dealing with technology-based approaches, network effects matter. So what that means is that the platforms that have contact with you, whether they be social platforms or e-commerce platforms or financial platforms, they're the ones that are getting most of the data. They're the ones that have the contact with you. They are increasingly becoming the point of entry for people into the financial system and where they live out their financial lives. Think of Amazon, how many times you transact, maybe not all of you, but many of us transact on Amazon for all different things. Or we don't just use Uber to get a car, but now we're ordering food using Uber. So these platforms have us. And then last but not least, which we'll talk about later with Stefan, is the changing role of monetary systems as a result of the digitalization of currencies in many different ways. So the Secretary General, um, of course, is one of the major supporters and uh, thinkers about the SDGs. He put forward a strategy last year at the General Assembly about financing Agenda 2030, and he pointed out several issues that he wanted to the UN to consider in terms of what it should be doing, and one of them was how do we harness the power of financial technologies to achieve the SDGs. And he specifically mandated that the head of the United Nations Development Program form a task force, and that's with whom I'm working to develop this task force and put it together, to advise the Secretary General on four basic questions. What's going on in terms of FinTech and finance? What are the applications of this so far to the SDGs? And what, does, what are the trends and what does this mean for the future and what the UN should be doing? Uh, here are our members. We have a very diverse group, everywhere from Samoa to Benin, uh, also to Europe and to Singapore. So it's been a really interesting experience for me personally to work with someone who runs a stock exchange in New York, 
and then of course more along my previous lines of work, working with someone who runs the second largest mobile money provider in Africa. Um, so we had to start with what the problem is. If we're thinking about funding the SDGs, we should think about, well, why aren't the SDGs being funded currently? And we've talked about that quite a bit. So the list up here really isn't an exhaustive list of the barriers that we need to overcome, but there's some of the common ones that consistently pop up as to why the SDGs aren't getting the finance that, uh, the finance that they should. And we've, we've talked a lot about these around data transparency, along the lack of good matrices that actually give people an idea of what is the financial trade-off, if any, of doing SDG investment. Or maybe more importantly, what's the social benefit or the social good that I'm generating as a result of doing it? That clearly is a major issue that keeps coming up. Lack of good instruments we've talked about as well. Um, and also, one thing we haven't talked about is we're assuming that the SDGs are this great investment opportunity. That is not clear. From an individual level, it is not clear that every SDG is a great investment opportunity. Collectively, we know that they are. Individually, maybe not so much. So we just have to realize that not all SDGs are the same. It might, you, for instance, you're going to have a lot more ability, and we're seeing a lot more steam on industries like clean energy, which have a business model that's enabled by digitalization and also has a profit model behind it, and you're seeing money start to really flow into clean energy. But you're not necessarily seeing that in terms of, say, gender equality. You're not necessarily seeing that in terms of ending hunger. So it just depends. The SDGs are not all alike, and therefore the source of funds for each one is going to be different as we go forward. And one thing I just wanted to mention, we discussed it briefly at our table before I go to technologies, is that when we talk about financing the SDGs, we tend to think about you know, the capital markets, and I will come back to that with some figures. But the fact is, the way that SDGs, finance, SDGs are financed today, especially when you go in the developing world, is largely people out of their own pocket. I'm financing my education. I'm financing my health care. I'm financing keeping my daughter in school. I'm financing securing water for my family. So when we think about financing the SDGs, we have to remember that people actually paying to finance the SDGs are often the individuals themselves. So as we talk about unlocking capital for the SDGs, we have to also think about how do we provide the models for individuals to help unlock the capital themselves in order to be able to invest in their daily lives. Because the great thing about the SDGs, and we talked about incentives, is that they improve my life individually. Many of them improve my life personally Many people around the world are super incentivized to solve their own SDG problem. So the question is, how do we help enable them to do that? Uh, because that would go a long way. So we took a look at a lot of the different technologies that are being applied to the digitalization of finance. And you're, I'm sure a lot of you in this room are familiar with many of them. Uh, some are at the high, very high levels of adoption and are really feeding into this disruption. Cloud computing, while it doesn't sound sexy, is a major driver of innovation within the financial sector because of the incredible reduced costs of setting up a financial institution due to cloud computing. It's, it's a major part of the disruption. Far less so is blockchain. Blockchain is really exciting, and I know every, everyone loves to talk about blockchain and the possibilities, and it does have amazing possibilities, but it is not actually very disruptive at present in terms of the financial sector. Much more disruptive are open, open banking APIs. That is hugely disruptive right now in the financial sector. So I just point this out because as we think about where we are, we sometimes have to separate maybe the hype from where we are, because sometimes the less sexy things like open APIs could be the more transformative than the more sexy things like, say, Internet of Things. Although we'll see, they could be as well. So we did, we did survey, we looked across the SDGs to look at how the digitalization of finance was um, helping or not helping or impacting at all some of the SDGs. What we found was actually a lot more than we had thought. A lot of it's very superficial. But if you look across the SDGs as a whole and how they're financed, because they're financed through individuals themselves, through governments, through the private sector, what we found is that at some level, there's a little bit of financial technology starting to touch all of them. Uh, the real question is, well, to what extent A is financing, in terms of that SDG, the most important issue to accomplish that SDG? So is financing really the issue? And then the other is, how far can financing go in the absence of 
a new business model that's actually going to make this more attractive investment. But here are some of the trends we saw in terms of digital finance assisting the SDGs. As mentioned, technologies are really at different stages of development. Private investors are increasingly interested in SDG outcomes. There's no doubt about that. We hear that time and time again, but are often frustrated in their ability to find the right assets or get the information they need. And that by far, right now, digital finance is mostly having breakthroughs at the retail business level. So although we're talking about moving capital markets, a lot of very interesting stuff is happening at the retail level, which allows individuals and corporations, communities, to fund their own SDGs. And that, you know, I mentioned governments before during our breakout session because governments are laggards. Governments are very slow to this digital finance game, and they will remain the major funder of SDGs for years to come. So that's a problem. We really have to focus on, on governments. And then last but not least, is there are not inconsequential risks to this in terms of what can happen as far as outcome. And I'll just show a slide. Uh, because as we dove down into the SDGs and technologies, we wanted to look at the pros and the cons. So for instance, there are a lot of great possibilities with big data and artificial intelligence, but there are a lot of real risks in terms of exclusionary impacts of big data and artificial intelligence that need to be considered. So as we are thinking very proactively about how we use digital science, the SDGs, we also need to think a little bit defensively about how we avoid some of the worst case scenario outcomes, which is how do we not make the situation worse because technology steps in to intervene. As an example, we were talking just in the corridor about uh, insurance. The insurance industry and some of its models are really going to be challenged by this individualized nature of data going forward. The whole idea of insurance is based on this idea of mutuality. Well, if I know everything about my neighbor and how they live, wouldn't I start to self-select them out of my insurance pool? <laughs> Having worked in microfinance for years, which was based on mutuality, let me tell you, that is exactly what happens. People, when they have enough information on whether somebody's a good or a bad risk, within their communities or their structures, start to wean people out or bring them in. So the fact that we can now start to pinpoint people's own behavior, their financial behavior, et cetera, down to the individual level, does put under strain sometimes this idea of collectivism or mutuality, and it's just a risk that we need to consider. And so some of the key opportunities that we've been focused on, they're very general, so my apologies for that, but there is there are some great opportunities in terms of digital really helping to mobilize more funds, so especially in a couple of areas. One is domestic resource mobilization within countries themselves. There is money in a lot of the countries where we want to achieve the SDGs. It's mobilizing that money in a more efficient way. But then second is that there is a lot of interest of private sector investors, as proven by the clean energy sector. When you give them a business model, they will come. And there's a lot of interest, but we need to find a better way to crowd them in faster around other SDGs. Uh, redeployment, as we're sitting in the World Bank, there are a lot of outdated models for how we do development finance. So how do we organize development finance as an industry more towards building opportunity as opposed to doing same old, same old. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about that. And then how do we better utilize existing financing by making it more efficient? Uh, and then we talked about some of the disbursement issues. Is how do we get rid of a lot of the middlemen to maximize the amount of money that goes into people's pockets? <coughs> Say you're doing social transfers. And how do you make public financing more efficient? But I wanted to point out, we do recognize there's risks and barriers, and one of the big ones, of course, is further discrimination as a result of data. But the, another one is that while digital is going to do a lot to bridge the divide, we feel in finance in, in the medium term, in the long term, it might actually deepen the divide when it stops being inclusive, because there's gonna be a whole generation or a group of people that are outside the digital economy, and they could fall increasingly further and further behind. And then crypto. I'm going to turn it over to Stefan, who's going to talk more about crypto. We have looked at uh, the impact of national and global monetary systems. And I guess we in the task force don't have a view on this yet. What we do see is that it's in its early days, and it's something we need to keep an eye on. There is no doubt that crypto as an industry is maturing beyond the days of super volatile Bitcoin um, into things around stablecoin and serious movements of central banks moving into digital currencies. There's a tremendous amount of efficiencies, especially around cross-border payments and around trade that could be realized. Also, there could be a great amount of efficiency for business innovation 
because right now if you want to get into a digital business, you have to have a relationship with a bank that will allow you to do that. This would actually remove that. So it could allow for a lot more innovation around digitally based businesses. But there's also potential downsides, which is it challenges the entire way we've been do doing banking for the last 500 years and the whole way in which money is created. So, um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to Stefan a little bit because I think you have some thoughts on how this might be a positive thing for sustainable development. Yeah, 